Uh, the Beagle was like that, a Saturn V space rocket is like that, a car is like that. Um, and I, mean, there's, I won't go into, into that, just, I don't know whether you can see that at the back, it's getting a little bit bright, but there, there we are, Will. There's just a uh, uh, formal definition of, of a car's polypheticness. Now, but I, moving on, what really happened in Tasmania was a clash between what's called entailed technology, things like the Beagle, and people who were using highly expedient technology. And really that's the difference. It's not that the Tasmanians were... Uh, not that the Tasmanians were not technological, they were just technological in a very different way. They, they practiced what I call reverse entailment, that is, they basically didn't rely <coughs> on chains of supply chains for anything that they needed. They're basically everything is point of use and uh, then discarded. And the classic example of that is their use of fire and lack of clothing. It all goes together. It's extremely neat. If you don't wear clothes, you haven't got any clothes to get wet. You don't need anywhere to dry them. You don't need a house to hang them up and you're not going to wander around in damp clothes, but you might get cold. Therefore, you need fire. You have fire with you the whole time. You carry it with you. Uh, in fire logs and in fire brands, you light a fire every time you stop. And if the fire goes out, as it sometimes would, uh, you don't go and start trying to make it. It's just like if we have a power failure, we don't start burning the furniture. We actually wait for social services to resume for the power company to come back on. We have a bit of a moan about it, and that's what the Tasmanians did with their fire logs. If it went out, they waited till another group helped them out or they found some from a bushfire or a lightning strike. There was a certain pride at stake, effectively. You weren't going to sit down and start bashing around with bits of wood and stone and things to try and make fire. You were going to have a moan about it and wait until you got your fire back. So they had fire organised, just like we have water organised or electricity organised. I don't know how to dig a well, but I've got some water here. So it's been very well socially organised for me. In a, it, it, this is in a, in a technological entailment process, because I don't know where this water came from, but the Tasmanians had their own system of technology which kept them highly supplied with all of the things they need. Bringing these ideas together, we can say that operating on the planet, in my view, there are three distinct systems of patterning. There is the patterning of inanimate systems, that is basically non-Darwinian. Inanimate physical hierarchies, chemistry. Pulsars, for example, don't compete with one another. Um, so there's no Darwinian evolution going on there. There are animate systems where we have a natural Darwinian competition going on between monothetic entities, and that's absolutely fine. And that's effectively what Darwin uncovered, and which has been developed since his time. And then we have this third system, which are material culture systems, <coughs> which are the artificial generation of variants among polythetic entities. So, what I want to turn to now um, is, is, is the part of my book, I think if you've seen the stuff that's been sort of reported in the press, it will already be a little bit more familiar to you which is how did we actually evolve biologically and what part did technology play in this massive expansion of brain size. And the question then is how did we get from Sahelanthropus chidensis, why did one line of evolution just level peg and become, if you like, chimpanzees and the other um, go via Australopithecines and Paranthropines to early Homo erectus ergaster uh, Neanderthals and eventually us. Why did that process happen? And there's a whole multi-part story here, which I can't go into in detail, I don't have time to, but which I can just signal that there is a paradox at the heart of it, which is in order to grow our brains, we have to lose a lot, lot of robusticity. We have to lose sagittal crest, we have to lose our big canines and so on, we have to expand the cranium. But uh, the, the, how, how can you actually go 
if you, if you lose that robusticity, then you don't have strong jaws, you can't actually manage to uh, get the reduction musculature, you need to grow the brain and have a gracile physique and become more intellectual. So effectively, the answer is that you have got to, at some stage, factor technology in, because it, it, we effectively are a set of accumulated biological deficits at an innate level, we, we are the biological, we're, we've evolved in the rain shadow, I would argue, of technology. But the stages by which that happened are very puzzling, and there are a number of real paradoxes in it. One of those paradoxes surrounds bipedalism, and I have a chapter in the book called The Smart Biped Paradox, because once we get upright walking, this is Ardipithecus ramidus, 4.8 million years ago, uh, what happens is that the pelvis has to stay quite narrow because at this point uh, the spine is now supported on the pelvis, that's a platform for the thorax and cranium and the legs have to remain quite close together so you would actually expect encephalization to be easier under natural selection conditions in chimpanzees than in humans in fact walking upright although it frees the hands and allows a more uh, facultative interaction with the environment doesn't do anything for head size. In fact, rather the reverse. It ought to, in fact, lock it down in perpetuity. Um, now, technology comes into this. This is from the Nature paper that came out a couple of weeks ago showing uh, getting a lot of meat into the diet. I mean, if you're going to grow brain, big brains, you're going to need a lot of protein. One of the things that, that again, is paradoxical is that, is that this upright gait shortens the gut, and as a number of people, such as Richard Rangham, have pointed out, that in itself means the energy equations of getting a big brain become all the more difficult. And again, you would expect it more in a chimpanzee than in a human. And fire, obviously, uh, Rangham argues that in fact to get our big brains we, we, we have to actually add energy into our food that we cannot possibly digest enough raw food to power the sorts of intellectuality we currently have without some control of fire and that has to come uh, early I think. I, I'm particularly interested though in the potential development among australopithecines of the baby carrying sling. I've, t I've talked earlier about the fact that archaeologists are in a sense hypnotised by the hard stuff, by the lithics, by the stone tools, because those are the things that survive. But clearly by the time you're able to do, produce standardised chipped stone tools at 2.6 million years ago, you probably have the cognitive ability to do something with, with animal skins. And chimpanzees certainly appreciate being able to carry things in bags. If you give them bags, they'll use them. Um, so cognitively, there's no reason to... Uh, not place a baby sling early, those are my own kids, as we was part of the generation that kicked back against wheeled transport of, of young. Um, but here's the issue, for an Australopithecine female, uh, walking bipedally on the savannah, work which I cite uh, in here done by colleagues of the US, uh, Wall Scheffler and uh, uh, Stoidal Numbers, uh, have calculated that the actual energy expenditure of hip carrying without unaided hip carrying is greater than the energy expenditure of lactation. So there would have been an immense pressure uh, on, well, there would have been immense benefits for any Australopithecine female who could come up with something like that. It's more profound though because what, for all the remodeling of the pelvis that occurs between three and a half million years ago and half a million years ago when we get our modern pelvic shape, the actual expansion of size of the, of the birth canal doesn't go up very much. Where the real expansion happens is after birth because humans are predominantly, uh, human babies are effectively fetuses. They basically display the most marked ontogenic retardation, the pedomorphism, that we see in any mammal. Our children are very, very helpless at birth, and they do a lot of head growth, even though the head looks big. I mean, the body's rubbish, and it can't hold the head up, and, you know, it's really, it's, it's really poor. But it, it doesn't matter, of course, because once you have this solution, 
then you've actually broken a glass ceiling because it 